Can an inherited gene mutation contribute to an increased risk of developing stomach cancer? Physicians Sonia Kupfer and Kevin Rogan join us to discuss the genetic factors of stomach cancer and the comprehensive care offered at UChicago Medicine. That includes personalized assessments and preventative options, as well as the unique resources available to patients with this disease. One of our guests is a patient who inherited the CDH1 mutation and had his stomach removed to eliminate his risk of cancer. Remember, we'll take your questions live coming up right now on At The Forefront Live. And joining us today is Dr. Sonia Kupfer, Dr. Kevin Rogan, and patient John Grossman. We want to remind our viewers that we'll take your questions and try to answer as many as we possibly can over the next half hour, but this program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. First of all, welcome to the program. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And if we can just start off and have each one of you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do here at U Chicago Medicine, and John, uh, also about your situation. Great, my name is uh, Dr. Kevin Rogan. I'm a surgical oncologist and primarily treat cancers of the stomach, pancreas, and upper GI tract. And I also have a strong interest in surgical education and lead our residency program. I'm Dr. Sonia Kupfer. I'm an adult gastroenterologist and I direct the GI Cancer Risk and Prevention Clinic here at the University of Chicago. My name is Jonathan Grossman, and I'm a CDH1 mutation carrier, and I am a patient of Dr. Rogan and Dr. Kupfer's. All right, let's just jump right into it with the questions. Of course, we remind our viewers, if you have any questions, just type them in the comments section. We'll try to take as many as we possibly can in the program. John, let's start with you and, and have you tell us a little bit about your, your situation and your journey. You just mentioned that you're a carrier of the CDH1 mutation. What exactly does that mean? Um, yeah, so like you said, I'm a CDH1 mutation carrier. Um, my mom carried the mutation and um, passed it down to me. Um, she received it from her father. Um, and what that means is I have a, a heightened risk of developing a type of stomach cancer that's um, a diffuse stomach cancer. Um, and so the recommendation uh, from the worldwide medical community is for CDH1 mutation carriers to have their stomach removed if they're healthy enough to do so. Um, and the reason being is that without any stomach tissue, you don't have any risk of getting stomach cancer. Um, so after weighing my options, I decided to have the surgery on June 1st, 2018. So it's been a little bit over a year. Um, and in case it's not obvious, I had my surgery with Dr. Rogan um, and had counseling from Dr. Kupfer uh, here at University of Chicago. And Dr. Kupfer, let's go to you next. When, when you see a patient like John, and we'll talk specifically about John, that's, that's got to be a very difficult situation for that patient to be in to make that kind of a decision. That's a big decision. How does that work as far as the counseling? What do you, what do you talk to and what do you tell the patient as they're going through this situation? Sure, so uh, the CDH1 mutation uh, leads to a condition known as hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. And as John had pointed out, the treatment uh, is at this point prophylactic removal of the stomach or prophylactic gastrectomy. And it is a big decision. And I think it comes, um, you know, we, we really need, can't take that lightly. And it's really important that the patient uh, and their family members are at the center of care and that all of the specialists that are needed um, are all on the team. So it's a multidisciplinary approach where a patient will meet with myself, with a genetic counselor, with a GI physician specialized in nutrition, of course with Dr. Rogan, and then as needed with other specialists such as women who need to have high risk breast cancer screening, um, uh, et cetera. So it really um, you know, takes a, a team effort and that's what we do here at the UFC. And Dr. Rogan, your portion of the team, you're the surgeon that performed the, uh, the procedure uh, robotically, is that correct? That is. Uh, explain to us kind of what the process is there. And first of all, w when we hear robotically, I didn't even know we did those kinds of procedures robotically, and that's, that's a, something that's fairly new, right? It is. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, um, we're all impressed by John's uh, uh, recovery and how well he's done and that he's become a true advocate for um, CDH1 carriers. I think the decision to undergo surgery is a, is a really important one, and there's a lot of issues to consider. 
uh, I think we try to make it about the patient because um, the timing of surgery and um, how we approach it can vary between individuals. But robotic surgery is a, a unique uh, tool. It's uh, part of our armamentarium, but uh, it's the same operation that we do when we do this in a traditional open technique with larger incisions. And so ideally, the surgery is the same uh, using both techniques. And it essentially involves removal of the entire stomach the surrounding lymph nodes, and then uh, reconstructing the stomach so that patients can eat and drink normally. And it's a quite an adjustment in terms of their lifestyle, um, and they lose weight, but eventually they get back to you know normal living. And so I think John's a really good example of when it works well, um, that you can go out and live your life and be advocates for people that have this disease. Hi, John, you're an interesting guy. I, I'm, I'm really impressed with you, first of all. <laughs> I met you a few weeks ago, and you told me some of your story, and it just, I I was so impressed with what you've done uh, as, you, as you're going through the process and then what you've done afterwards as far as being an advocate to other folks who may be facing a similar situation. Can you kind of tell us what, what that's been like for you and why that's so important to you to get the word out? You have a, a, a blog, a website, and, you, and you, you speak with a lot of folks that may be facing a similar decision. Well, thank you for your kind words. I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so for those of you who don't know, I do have a website up. It's um, www.cdh1gene.com. Um, I encourage you to visit it. It's a, basically um, a number of articles that I've written and a few guest bloggers have written sharing my story. And it, for the guest bloggers, in their case, they're sharing their stories. Um, and it also tries to weave in, the, the articles try to weave in what the uh, publications say in the medical journals um, and also things that um, I and my family members have heard anecdotally or learned through experience and the intention is to spread awareness for um, the, the mutation that it let people know that it exists and what the risks are. Um, a lot of people have heard of the BRCA1 and 2 mutations. It's a fairly highly um, well-known mutation, but some of these other mutations that are out there, including the CDH1 mutation, most people haven't heard of. And in, in addition, they haven't heard of um, prophylactic total gastrectomy. And so to get the word out, um, I started this blog, um, or this website, and also it's, um, for me, it's been a little therapeutic to write about it and to talk about my experience. So not only am I spreading awareness, but it's, a, it's an outlet for me to help with my recovery. Um, I, I think the physical part of the recovery, um, it can vary from individual to individual, but in, and, and it's challenging, but in some ways the mental aspects of the recovery are the most challenging, and one way that I've coped with that is by writing and, and sharing my story. Um, so th that's sort of the, the, the story behind the website. You know, it's interesting, we, we, we are in the midst of a pretty significant campaign here at UChicago Medicine, Together We Can Answer, Together We Answer Cancer. And, and the together part to me is what really makes all of this work because when we talk to folks like you, John, you, you talk about your family a lot, you talk about the team that worked with you here at UChicago Medicine, and it's, it, it's always interesting to me to see just the, the community and, and what happens when people come together to, to fight something like this. And in your case, as you put together your blog and you got the information out to people, you've had other people ask you questions, and I don't know, to me that is just, it's, it's, it's really, a, I think, a, a spectacular thing that you're doing, and, and that's great. And, and Dr. Rogan said something to me, and I would love you for you to expound on this, when we did the interview a few weeks ago about learning from your patients, specifically John. I don't know if you can kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think it just gets down to like empathizing with your patients and imagining that you're in that scenario. And so for John, I mean, it could be any one of us that was in his situation. And so I think of it as like um, you're, he's on a journey, but we're there to guide him. And uh, I think, uh, you know, physicians that like pay attention to their patients can learn a lot. And it's both inspiring and also helps me for the next patient that I have with his condition so that I can relate to him better and try to anticipate you know, aspects of his recovery that you might otherwise forget about when you're thinking about the technical side of the operation that's required. And one thing I just wanted to mention, and I tell every patient this, is that 
um, John asked me to tell every patient that even if they didn't think they needed it, that there was psychological care, mm -hmm. um, a, psychi a, a psychologist with whom we work. And so I, I make that available to everyone and I just say, I promised John I would say <laughs> that. And so I definitely have learned and have put it into practice. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. And Tim, I'd just like to add that um, I'm not really too unique amongst CDH1 mutation carriers. That there are a lot of folks out there who are spreading the word and creating awareness. And I feel like I'm just one voice amongst a bigger chorus. Um, I've got a couple cousins who have um, donated money or raised money who have their own, um, whether it's Instagram or some sort of blog or internet presence. Um, and then I know there's a, a Facebook group that I rely on heavily called CDH1 Mutation, where there are a lot of folks who came before me who've done a lot more advocacy than I have. So. Um, if anything, I feel like I'm following the lead of so many wonderful people who have helped the community who came before me. So, And you're also very humble. So that's <laughs> the positive. So Dr. Kupfer, could you talk to us a little bit about the Cancer Risk and Prevention Clinic and what exactly is that? And obviously it played a huge role in, in John's treatment. Yeah, so the clinic here at the University of Chicago is uh, unique, and what we focus on is individuals who are at increased risk for <coughs> gastrointestinal cancers, including of the stomach, but also of the pancreas and uh, colorectal cancer. And our approach is, as I mentioned, multidisciplinary. I work closely with a genetic counselor and with other specialists as needed to help these individuals understand what their risk is through potentially genetic testing, and then to get them on the right path to treatment be it prophylactic surgeries or uh, increased screening, for example, with colonoscopy. Great. And Dr. Rogan, as you, you, you work with these various patients, uh, you, we were talking a little bit before the show, and you mentioned that there are a couple of different types of stomach cancer that people need to be aware of, and one, of course, is the hereditary, and then one is the, uh, is the uh, just the sporadic stomach cancers. Can you uh, differentiate between the two? Sure. Uh, by far mo the most common form is gastric adenocarcinoma, what most people refer to as stomach cancer, and that's a cancer uh, that occurs along the lining of the stomach, and it's similar to colon cancer where it usually can be seen visibly. Um, and what John had was a unique uh, inherited mutation uh, that predisposes patients to cancers, very small cancers that are sort of below the surface. And in John's case, there's no really um, um, great mechanism for identifying cancer early. Uh, but stomach cancer, gastric adenocarcinoma, is a different uh, form. And in most patients, the symptoms are very um, vague in the beginning, and it's not discovered until late. Um, and the treatments are different. And so I think it's important to raise awareness to both uh, conditions and make sure that if you're having symptoms that you seek attention, uh, because a lot of people delay getting treatment because they're fearful of the diagnosis. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, we should try to encourage people to talk to their physicians. What would some of those symptoms be? Well, the symptoms of stomach cancer, I said, were very, are very vague. They yeah. can be a loss of appetite, uh, weight loss, um, sometimes people will um, vomit blood or vomit in general. Um, so I think it's hard to um, pinpoint one specific symptom, but I think by far and away, if you're not feeling well, if you're losing weight unexpectedly, I would strongly recommend people to bring these symptoms up with their doctors. And Dr. Kupfer, you mentioned the, the team approach that you Chicago Medicine takes uh, for situations like this. Why is that so important? You know, obviously there are a lot of folks involved in the treatment, but you know, in John's situation or other people that face this, why do they need all of these people involved? Sure. So certainly when there's a hereditary condition, we often are doing genetic testing, and so with that comes a lot of questions and counseling that, that we want to do before and after the genetic testing. Uh, in terms of making a decision about surgery, we need to have a surgeon involved. Um, and then, especially when someone has their entire stomach removed, there are some functions of the stomach that we need to think about, specifically some vitamin uh, deficiencies and how we're going to manage those, and also um, how the you know, how people will eat after their stomach is removed. And that's the reason to have a, a specialist in nutrition involved. And as I mentioned, for women, there's also um, breast cancer screening uh, that we do. So John, let's, let's talk about your situation because life changed pretty substantially for you after this surgery. And, and, and we chat a little bit about your, your dietary habits, uh, how they changed and kind of the things you had to do. Can you fill us in and, and just explain to us how that all works? Uh, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> we can go all day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll try to do it succinctly. So, um, 
you know, one of the most surreal parts of through this whole experience has been the voluntary part of this. It's it's voluntary in the sense that you know each individual who's a mutation carrier can elect to have the the surgery or not. It, no one is forcing you to. Um, it's just it's, it's it's an odds situation and. Um, and so one of the most surreal parts is going from a perfectly healthy individual with no symptoms to someone who now has to make lifestyle modifications and deal with some things that um, aren't always pleasant or enjoyable. So, um, the, you know, the first few weeks after the surgery um, were probably the most challenging physically in terms of uh, just any, you know, pain from any type of surgery. and then. Um, learning how to eat again and, and learning how to read signals from, from the body. So like for instance, um, the feeling of hunger is a little bit different now. Um, at, at first it was a lot different, but at, over time um, my body has adjusted and my mind has adjusted and knows what signals to read for when I'm hungry. Um, in terms of what I eat, at this point, um, you know, like 15 or so months post-surgery, I eat fairly regularly. I'd say the most, the biggest difference is the volumes. Um, I eat smaller, more frequent meals. Um, you know, if, if I were out to dinner with you and you had no clue that I'd had the surgery, um, you probably wouldn't think much of it. I order entrees and usually eat, you know, over half, if not the entire entree. Um, in terms of types of foods, um, at first, the high sugar foods were probably the most problematic. They can cause something called dumping syndrome, which presents itself differently in, in different individuals. Um, for me, I would get clammy and feel uncomfortable, all just sort of generally, and get some gurgles in my gut. Um, and occasionally, my mind, I'd have some strange thoughts, like feelings of impossibility and just wanting the situation to end. But I don't think I've ever had an episode last longer than probably 45 minutes, um, whether it's from eating the wrong food or eating too much food. So Is that just the sugar hitting your system? All yeah, I'll, um, I can try to explain it. I'm sure one of the doctors <laughs> would do a better job. But my understanding is that when the excess sugar enters the small intestine, um, the body reacts by producing too much insulin. And by producing too much insulin, then, the, then that's when the symptoms start to uh, manifest and so it takes time then for the body to, to readjust and to account for the fact that uh, there's too much insulin in, in the blood. And over time you just kind of developed your your own system of, of, of dealing with with things and and you kind of learned a new way to, to eat? That and I think the body builds up tolerances just like for healthy for people who haven't had the surgery, just yeah. like with any sort of substance, whether it's sugar, or alcohol, or caffeine. Um, and, you know, I think, I think each individual is different. So my experience might be similar to other people's, but it's not going to be identical. Um, and, you know, a lot of it probably depends on what sort of lifestyle you had pre-surgery, what sort of lifestyle you have post-surgery. Um, one of the things that I kept reminding myself and my, my dad kept reminding me is, to just get back to the basics. I had sort of a routine that was designed to sort of be a gentle li living or like a gentle lifestyle. Um, I know what that means. I don't know if other people do, but um, so when things would start to go astray, whether it was in you know month two or month eight or you know last week, is what I try to do is just to go back to the basics, to the types of foods and lifestyle that I know that works for me. and. Um, and the times where I've had to do that, it's worked. And, um, and uh, you know, I think at this point, it's just the new normal and it's something that I've grown accustomed to and will continue to be sure. accustomed to. So. Want to remind our viewers, if you have any questions for our experts or for John, please just type them in and we'll get to them. What, what, if, if you have a family history of stomach cancer, what, what should you do? Is there, do you need to be aware of that? Is that something you should be concerned with? Yeah, definitely. Certainly when we see the same type of cancer in multiple family members or certain combinations of cancers like stomach cancer and a specific type of breast cancer called lobular breast cancer, but also if there's breast cancer and pancreatic cancer or colon cancer and endometrial cancer, uh, those are reasons to talk to your doctor at least to, to, to start the conversation and ask whether genetic 
counseling and testing um, would be of value. It should be noted also that for stomach cancer in particular, not the diffuse hereditary kind, but for what we were talking about before, the adenocarcinoma, there are other risk factors. So for example, an infection of the stomach called Helicobacter pylori is something that multiple family members could also be infected with, and that could be the reason why there seem to be multiple people in the family. But that's something that people can be tested for and treated for and could potentially prevent uh, stomach cancer as well. So definitely, if there are multiple family members, it's worth asking your doctor and certainly coming to see um, someone uh, at a center like ours. And Dr. Rogan, can you talk to us a little bit about the procedure itself and exactly what it entails? What, what do you do when you're, when you're doing one of these procedures? Sure. Uh, well, first we uh, want to make sure that the stomach is entirely removed. I think that's critical for CDH1 gene mutation carriers because if you can remove all the stomach lining, you reduce the risk of them getting stomach cancer in the future. For patients with uh, gastric adenocarcinoma or stomach cancer, the operation may change depending on where the tumor is located in the stomach. And for those patients, we try to conserve stomach as much as possible. And then uh, comes the, once you've removed the cancer and ensure that you've or removed all the stomach, uh, then, then it's about reestablishing continuity of the GI tract so that people can swallow normally, mm -hmm food can go into their intestine and you can absorb the nutrients. So um, that, there's a variety of different ways that that can be performed. Uh, there are reconstructive techniques that involve recreating a pouch um, and it's controversial whether that's really helpful for patients. Um, and then um, obviously um, it's important to um, make sure that the operation is done safely and that they've recovered. Uh, there are multiple different approaches, whether it's open, laparoscopic, or robotic, and I think as long as you're doing the correct operation, uh, that's what's most important. There may be some slight advantages in terms of recovery because the incisions are smaller with a minimally invasive approach. Um, it may be more costly to the patient, and so we always try to factor in um, all of those factors and present them with options and are facile at doing uh, any technique that is individualized to the patient. And you have to watch the patient for a time afterwards to make sure that everything is, is working properly, is that correct? Absolutely. I think the post-operative recovery immediately in the hospital is the most challenging because there can be complications that can occur. And um, this operation, if you look at whether it's done open or robotically, is associated with complication rates that can be 25 to 50 percent. And um, our job is with experienced nurses and really um, involving the family members is to make sure that we prevent those kind of complications or if they occur, identify them early and offer the patient's treatment. But yes, the inpatient recovery is challenging, but I think um, as John was alluding to in his story, it's a, a lifelong recovery and uh, there's different stages of recovery. And Tim, sorry to interrupt you, I just uh, to, to sort of dovetail off Dr. Rogan's point about the complications is um, not even knowing what the complications were, when I first heard that the recommendation for mutation carriers was to have the stomach removed, uh, my first reaction, I didn't know if I had the mutation or not at that point, and my first reaction was um, that that was crazy, that if I had the mutation that I would not have my stomach removed. Um, but then at the time, my mom was sick with the, the disease. She had diffuse stomach cancer, um, and so I was watching her experience um, dealing with the disease. Um, meanwhile, I had an aunt and a cousin who had their prophylactic gastrectomies, and I was watching them um, recover from their surgeries. And comparing those two different scenarios, my mom suffering with the disease to my aunt and cousin recovering from their gastrectomies, uh, my mindset totally flipped, and I thought it was crazy to not have the prophylactic gastrectomy because my mom just consistently kept getting worse whereas my aunt and cousin kept getting better. So, and, and they had complications. They had, they both had some um, significant complications. And um, despite those complications, it still was apparent to me that there was no question that having the surgery was the way to go. Huge, huge decision though on your part, and, and but you, you went through the process, you talked with Dr. Kupfer, I would imagine, and, Absolutely. and helped you 
yeah. make that decision. And just to point out that with this diffuse gastric cancer, if there were a way that we could detect it early through endoscopy or through a camera that we use to look into the stomach, we absolutely would do something like that. Unfortunately, in this condition, um, we don't have that possibility because the diffuse gastric cancer doesn't grow as a, a mass or as an ulcer, it tends to grow into the lining of the stomach and it's really, really hard for us to, to detect. I, I tell patients it's like a needle in a haystack. We hope that we can get better with that, but even with taking many, many, many biopsies, it's still very hard to find the cancer. And so um, that's another reason. If, if there were another way to detect this cancer early, of course we would be doing that and hopefully in the future we'll have something like that with more research in this area. Um, just to point out that for individuals who are not at risk for the hereditary diffuse gastric cancer type, doing endoscopy is still a way that we can potentially find um, adenocarcinoma early. Often, as Dr. Rogan had mentioned, it can present as something that we can see when we do endoscopy. It looks like an ulcer. It's a non-healing ulcer. It looks like a mass. Um, and we can also, as I mentioned, detect H. pylori. So um, this is not to say that there's no role for endoscopy for stomach cancer at all. It's just that in the diffuse gastric cancer type, um, we have a very hard time finding it. We do have a, a question from a viewer that I'd like to uh, ask you doctors. Uh, do my three children have an increased risk for gastric cancer because their father has gastric cancer? Is any early screening available to them in the United States? Uh, so uh, with one first degree relative, the risk is, is not necessarily increased. As I mentioned, there are other factors besides genetic factors. So for example, getting tested for H. pylori is a consideration for uh, for the children depending on how old they are. Um, also doing uh, more extensive digging in the family to determine if there are other cases of stomach cancer, what type of stomach cancer the, the father had. All of those factors are important in our risk assessment to determine whether something is likely to be hereditary or not. Uh, so uh, are there other cancer risks that are associated with the CDH1 mutation? Yeah, so um, the main other risk um, is in women for a type of breast cancer called lobular breast cancer. And so that risk is estimated um, a lifetime risk of about 42% for women. And as a result of that high risk, we do recommend all of our uh, mutation carriers undergo high risk screening. And they do that uh, through MRI and mammography. And some actually choose to have prophylactic mastectomy. As of now, those are the main associations for cancer. There was at one point a, a concern for an association with colon cancer, but that really has not been borne out. Um, and then there are some other associations with cleft palate, cleft lip, for example. So these are all factors that we take into consideration when we uh, do risk assessment and look at a family history. So John, I, I want you to kind of close us out. I just, again, talking with you, you're, you're an impressive guy. You're, you're always always learning. You're trying something new right now, which I think is great. And you, you know, you're working on these this website and and sharing your information and your knowledge with people. What does the future look like for you? I mean, you're doing quite well, obviously. I mean, are you, are you excited about the future? This is not holding you back at all. Uh, I am very excited about the future. Yeah, this is not holding me back at all. Um, I joke with some family and friends that it's really difficult for me to engage in small talk these days because there's really no part of my life that's lends well to small talk. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm very excited about the future. Um, you know, I, I would like to point out that I think one of the most important parts about raising awareness for this situation or whether it's some other health situation is just um, is, is seeking out answers when, when, when you can and, um, and being your own best advocate. And there are amazing doctors and caregivers out there, but at the end of the day, you have to be your own best advocate. And um, my family's a living example. We had all the information um, available to us and all the tools available to us to prevent my mom's early death. But because the information wasn't presented to us in the right way and we weren't necessarily looking in the right places, we, were, uh, we missed that opportunity. But um, the connection between this mutation and the disease was discovered in the late 90s. Um, we had a, a cousin of my mom's, a distant cousin of my mom's, who passed away from diffuse gastric cancer. Um, genetic testing was uh, high enough quality um, at the time, and, and prophylactic gastrectomy was also a possibility. 
um, all of those uh, before my mom died. So had we been able to connect all those dots, um, maybe we, maybe I wouldn't be sitting here talking today. But um, or or I would be telling a slightly different story. Yeah. Um, so I, I encourage those of you who have any questions about your health situation or um, genetic uh, predispositions, I, I encourage you to to look into it and to not necessarily let critics or criticism get in your way because if if you have an instinct or, or a, a feeling out there that something about your or your family's health situation is amiss, then I encourage you to, to look into it and to not let any obstacles um, get in your way. So, And we have some pretty good physicians that will help you with that too. <laughs> Absolutely. That's all the time we have for the program today. Thank you very much for, for doing this, guys. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for watching and submitting your questions. And please continue to check out our Facebook page for future At the Forefront Live programs and other helpful information. Also, please check out the website at uchicagomedicine.org slash cancer or for an appointment, you can call 855-702-8222. Thanks for watching. Have a great week.